Good evening, and thank you everybody for being here. This is a painting by uh, a Maori painter, Rolf Hotary, who's a New Zealander, um, and that also comes into this talk. But the, the idea of um, geometries of virtue is a slightly difficult one. In part, it relates to that Winston Churchill phrase, um, which is often quoted, uh, I think he said, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. There are different versions of that available to, according to which authority you choose, but um, the sentiment is clear and surprisingly widely accepted um, if you go by how many times at least it's repeated, you know, one person to another. So often, in fact, it's virtually a cliché. But I'm interested, really, in whether it's true, whether they do, in fact, shape us, and how that works, and whether, if it does work uh, in any way that's predictable or controllable, how we might be able to shape, use our buildings to shape our lives, I suppose, for the better. In other words, whether buildings and cities can actually be forces for good in any way. So that immediately brings up the interesting and I think difficult issue of whether the geometry of place has any inherent moral quality. It's almost never discussed. I think that's also interesting, whether you're thinking academically, professionally, or publicly. We don't talk about the relationship between ethics and aesthetics. It's, um, you know, when we're talking about ancient or distant cultures, be it ancient Troy or Mesopotamia, um, you know, or even, for example, Alberti, we're comfortable talking about the resonance and by implication the meaning and sort of the moral meaning of place and with the idea that there might be such a meaning. But when we talk about our own places, that stuff is really not polite not part of the conversation. I suspect that might be why, although I think most architects and planners are quite strongly morally motivated, good people on the whole, wanting to do good things, um, and although most of us have more freedom and leisure and wealth and education than most people have ever had before, and although more of us live in cities than ever before, uh, we still, despite all of those things, make places that we don't, broadly speaking, like very much. And I think that's really interesting. Um. <laughs> really, the lecture's over now. <laughs> um, this is Darling Harbour. I'm going to say nothing about this slide. But it is interesting that there were times and places when um, it was expected uh, that cities and public places would have an intense and understood spiritual resonance, and that that was seen as being part of their role, part of their purpose. Uh, in some cases, it was kind of environmental or at least health-related, for example, the ancient Etruscans, uh, before founding a city, would um, take a number of auguries, and what they would do is kill anim animals who lived on the site where they were thinking of um, locating the city and look at their liver. And, uh, and that was, um, it was a kind of, I suppose, voodoo, but also, of course, a kind of health inspection to see whether these animals were healthy and therefore whether it was a, a healthy place to build a city. So that, at that level, you might see it as just sort of survivalism, but there are um, much more, or less physical, I suppose, more, if you like, spiritual um, approaches to the symbolism of city making. This is a medieval image of Jerusalem. Uh, and, you know, we've just had Mental Health Week. We know that even if we're just talking survival, survival is, as a quality, is much more than just physical. Um, at one level we know that. We know that it's moral and psychological. 
we know that those things are important and that they're not actually divisible from the physical. Um, historically, therefore, it's not surprising that the city has often been seen as a mother. City as mother is one of those tropes that you find recurring through quite a lot of literature as though, as though she could sort of hide us in the folds of her skirts, you know, protective, uh, nurturing, fostering. So I suppose I want to argue tonight that all of that is that kind of thinking and that kind of understanding of city is still possible. It sounds remote and fanciful. Um, and certainly if you imagine yourself standing in front of a bunch of developers or city planners and talking about this stuff, you think, oh, so not, you know. <laughs> um, and yet I want to argue that spatial meaning is possible and that modernism deprived us um, of the capacity to either interpret or create this kind of meaning, and that further, um, at reinvesting in our, if you like, spatial fluency um, is actually, I suspect, likely to prove essential to our um, happiness and our survival. So at that level, it's kind of important, even though it also feels kind of embarrassing. It's not a very academic talk. Uh, it's a little bit theoretical, it's a little bit personal, um, and it's also a little bit unresolved, partly because I think it's a difficult question, but that's why it's interesting to me. I could and possibly should have chosen something easier to talk about. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it is interesting because it's difficult, because it's unresolved, and also, I'm actually, I find myself so sick of those old, persistent, modernist models that I think still rule our lives and our minds and our cities, the biological model, essentially, of the human um, as just a machine, as, as, as if our needs are just physical, as if it's all just about making it work, you know, at a physical level. I'm so tired of that stuff. I'm so tired of the assumption. I'm so tired of the derision that's based on that. So I just thought it'd be interesting to talk about this stuff. So this is kind of a little bit of a quest, <laughs> this talk. It's a hunt, if you like. Um, and I hope that if it gets a bit weird, <laughs> you'll bear with me. Um, this struck me as a good opportunity to be exploratory. So I wanted to talk about this not because um, I'm especially virtuous and not because I'm especially interested in moralizing, although I am sometimes accused of that. Um, <laughs> I, for me, from the inside of me, it, it feels as though I'm just interested, I'm not interested in telling people what to do, but what I am interested in is understanding what it means to be good and um, whether, further, goodness is something that we can create, actually make, you know. In other words, what is the link between morality and form, or if you like, between ethics and aesthetics? I've been writing about architecture for more than 30 years, which seems ridiculous. It's a long time. Uh, and still, this relationship, which has always interested me, troubles me, um, as indeed my relationship with architecture troubles me, because I sometimes think, you know, if it's... Uh, uh, this is um, the other thing that I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> uh, this is Barangaroo. You can see it's still got... Uh, this image has still got the ghost um, of the hotel, uh, which everybody hated so much that it's being replaced by something twice as big. It just seems reasonable. Um, so, property, uh, architecture is generally seen, uh, architecture and by extension city making, is generally seen either as just a question of property rights, which a lot of uh, politicians argue, for example, uh, the mayor of Melbourne said that to me recently. It's just about property rights. There are no other issues in city planning. Um, or as a kind of competition for the most out there form making. Um, this is the Gary, of course, which is currently nearing completion. Um, this is looking from the north. In other words, around the back street. Um, and this is, of course, Zaha. Uh, they're really just examples of what I think of as reasonably arbitrary form making. I think that's fine. Most people love them. I don't love them. I don't hate them. I, I just, if this is what architecture is, if this is all it is, I'm just bored. 
I'm not out of, out of here, you know. That's fine, everyone's welcome to do it, but I'm not interested, I'll just write about something else. <laughs> so for me, it's kind of important to understand whether or not there is this moral heart at the core of our disciplines. Um, so although I find myself bored by this kind of form making, and actually always have been, even when I was a student, I was thinking, I remember thinking, oh, that's really clever, but yeah, you know, so what? Um, and yet, despite being bored by that stuff, I'm also, I find myself really intensely interested in place and the nature and resonance and meaning of place. Uh, what makes you feel good? Um, what the difference is between a place that dignifies people and a place that makes you feel like, you know, you're it's in a, a, some sort of Darrow on a bad night, you know. And I think place can have that effect, certainly can have that effect on me. So, to me, it seems inescapable that there is some at least potential moral heart to the business of dwelling on the planet, the business of being there. Um, and that is really my core intuition here, that goodness, that goodness is inherently related to happiness, but also that the place where those things intersect and the, and the investment of that quality, that intersection, in spatial terms, bestows a sense of the sacred in some way. Um, and further, that discovering that sense of the sacred or rediscovering it or re maybe hearing it is, uh, will likely prove critical to our survival in the future. So that's kind of the basic story. And that's what I want to investigate. Um, a little bit of backstory here. This is another Ralph Hotere painting. I grew up in New Zealand. Uh, I was an intensely, I think, um, romantic child. Um, you know, we usually think here of, Australia, of New Zealand as being a bit of a suburb of, of Australia. But I think actually on reflection that they're quite different cultures in, in one or two important ways. In particular, I think there's a very intense strand of romanticism in New Zealand culture, which is not, which to my knowledge is not so present or not so intense in, uh, in Australia. And that's partly perhaps to do with the landscape, or probably pa partly to do with the history, but I'm thinking of the poets, um, I don't know if anyone knows much about New Zealand culture, but A.R.D. Fairburn, R.A.K. Mason, James K. Baxter, you know, there's also Jane Campion and the piano, uh, Hone Tufare, who's a fabulous Maori poet, um, Ralph Hotere, and Colin McCann, all personal favourites of mine. Uh, this is this is lovely because, as you can see, the uh, this um, land of the wrong white crowd. Um, the Maori name for New Zealand is Aotearoa, which is um, land of the long white cloud. <laughs> it's usually translated. So this is a sort of play. I think it's really lovely. Um, I recall when I was about 13, I think, I said to my mum, uh, what, what, what does it mean to be good? Yeah? Uh, probably a lot of teenagers worry about this stuff. I was, I was concerned to know who you could believe. You know, I'd been reading stuff, I guess, which, of course, you should never do as a teenager. <laughs> and I was, you know, I was reading some existentialism and stuff, which I would never let my children read. Um, <laughs> But so I was going, you know, so who's right about this? And she said, my mother disappointed me, um, but I think it was she did me a great favour by saying she didn't know. She didn't know who you should believe. So I did some more reading. Um, and, you know, people like Sartre and Herman Hesse and John Fowles and all sorts of quite dangerous writers, <laughs> if you're worried about, you know, truth and where it goes. Um, at university I enrolled for medicine but they stupidly gave me a year in which I didn't have to do medicine, I could do whatever I liked, so I did philosophy and that was kind of the end of that. So I studied Plato and Aristotle and all that stuff and although it didn't provide any answers really, it did, it did help me frame all those questions about what is good and what it means to lead the good life. Those guys were quite obsessed by the idea of the good life and they didn't mean, you know, sitting under a palm tree with a pina colada they were interested in, um, not even in pleasure, but in, in the happiness that, that they thought goodness would bring. 
and they also saw it as coming through the life of the mind, through philosophy, in other words, which is lovely and which is kind of encapsulated in Plato's cave metaphor, but that's for another time. But so the Greek um, word arete, which a lot of you will know, um, encompassed physical excellence and good health and beauty, but also mental excellence and sort of intellectual prowess and spiritual capacity, nobility, really, I suppose. The medieval idea of nobility is strongly related and even has the same, um, is even called virtue. But um, so it was taken for granted that moral goodness and physical goodness or beauty that, that were related, were intrinsically related. In other words, that ethics and aesthetics were part of the same thing. By the time I came to study architecture, um, so I was therefore already a little bit obsessed by this idea of the moral, and what, what the good life meant, what it meant, you know, what goodness meant, um, which is a bit, oh, this is another, yeah. <laughs> That was another Colin McCallum, which is really beautiful, but this is... Um, so I, was, I used to remember being in the architecture school library and picking up Rainer Bannum, um, madman from the UK. He, um, this is him in London. He uh, used to write essays in the architecture review, and I used to pick them up. And uh, they used to be in that big printing on that sort of fat paper, for anyone who remembers the ARs from those days. And they were magic. He was such a good writer. And he, he, he approached that stuff about the kind of morality. Later on, he would, you know, he became a kind of, um, I don't know, functionalist modernist. Uh, and he was a modernist, but he was also really interested in that core and also a really good writer. But he was also, for me, he was frustrating because he would sort of approach the question and never really quite go there. So um, I found that I couldn't get to the heart of it. This wonderful image is, um, <laughs> uh, is one of Bannum's, it's from his um, 1971 book, it's called A House Is Not A Home which I'm not really going to talk about, even though it is a wonderful image, so I had to put it, put it up, really. But, so, people like him, and then, oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Um, there was another fellow called Arthur Tristan Edwards, who wrote in the 1920s about um, a book called Good and, Good and Bad Manners in Architecture, which I used to keep picking up and thinking, oh, this should be interesting, this should be really interesting. You know, manners was a kind of interesting... Um, idea, I thought, but he, and it was, but it, it ended up being just about sort of context, sort of contextualism and politeness, but not really getting to the heart of it again. So I found that it was frustrating. Whatever I read didn't really go there. You could read about goodness in philosophy and ethics, but you couldn't read about any of that stuff to do with architecture, and I couldn't understand why not. Postmodernism, of course, in, in those days was just beginning. And we made student pilgrimages to see things like this, which was Charles Moore's um, Piazza d'Italia in uh, New Orleans, um, which was kind of interesting, kind of crazy. But I thought it was pretty wonderful at the time because it did all these interesting things with water and it was very sensual and uh, all the stuff that modernism hadn't been. Um, there was also some quite silly stuff like this, which was Terry Farrell, um, uh, now, Sir Terry Farrell, I think. Um, but anyway, this is one of his early things. This is the TVAM building. So the boiled eggs on top of it were a sort of a little joke about breakfast television, um, you know. And that was kind of the level of it. And you sort of think, oh, you know, it's sort of fun and it's sort of stupid. Um, but it was as though that was it for meaning in architecture. You know, that was kind of all you could really get to. And now, of course, Postmodernism has gone nowhere, um, except maybe Melbourne, I guess. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you have to be rude, don't you? I mean, that's the point. Um, you know, so I sort of accepted um, Robert Venturi's critique of modernism that it failed because it... Um, because of its reductivist approach, because it simplified the program to the point where there was no problem to solve, so anyone could solve it. Um, and to the point, therefore, where you know, this could actually pass for the plan of a house, which it clearly is not. You know. um, it's beautiful. This is the Farnsworth house. Um, it's very beautiful, but it's not a house, you know, and of course, we all know the story, and the person for whom it was built um, was unable to live there, not only because she hated him, but also because she hated the house. 
Um, and, be, and, you know, because it has no interior. It's got, you know, two little bathroom thingies. And that's it. That's it in terms of interior. The rest is all just external space with a little bit of glass around it. You know, so um, I think that's really interesting. It's the fact that this became such an icon, uh, such an immense icon, this and, and all the other things like it became such icons. Um, and yet there was something irresistible about it, of course. It was beautiful. And also the rhetoric was intensely moral, intensely moral. And all that stuff about honesty and authenticity and, you know, transparency and the sort of crystalline, whatever it is, raising to heaven. All the, the talk was really seductive and, and strongly uh, <laughs> celestial, actually. So, as anyway, uh, in my um, something like second year, oh, this is the Farnsworth, of course, which... It's just demonstrating how beautiful it is and also how uninhabitable. Uh, it's interesting how many of the best, you know, the revered houses designed by architects, and I think Falling Water, for example, um, end up being given as museums to the state because, you know, no one can actually live in them. Um, and that's something that you could write a PhD on, probably. Why that is, why, um, anyway. <laughs> no, anyway. So I became interested in these guys in New Zealand. They were called the Group Architects. They were um, rampant socialists. They were, this is a house called the First House. Of course, everything had to have really plain names and really plain packaging because they were, you know, socialists. Um, <laughs> and that was the thing. Uh, this is a, so it's called the First House and it was really plain. Um, and uh, this was built in 1950. So it was old by the time I was looking at it, but I became really interested in them because of the rhetoric and because of the relationship between the rhetoric and the buildings. And this, um, one of these guys, the guy standing at the back on the left, I think that's him, Alan Wilde, became the Dean of Architecture. Um, but that's, it's irrelevant ex except that this was, oh, this was their manifesto. It's really sweet. Um, it talks about, you know, the necessity for architecture. I mean, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, about, uh, they wrote two little publications, they're both tracts, really. This was one, the other one was called Planning One, it, but everyone used to call it Eye Planning because it looked like that. But because nothing had, there were no serifs and there were no uppercase and there was no, you know, because that was all part of the deal, that was all, you know, taking Adolf Loos on board and there was no decoration and it was all very plain. And um, so there was going to be this, and, and of course there was this beautiful avant-garde Bauhaus typeface. And that was also part of the deal, and, and anyone could join, and there were no joining fees, and there were no bosses, uh, so of course it all fell apart. But <laughs> and there were also no walls and no decorations, and no, you know, because that was all much too hierarchical. Um, so it was intensely utopian uh, and interesting, and there was sort of the assumption that if you built, uh, you know, a thing called, and you put on the plan children's play space, this was where children would play, and it would be tolerable when they made too much noise and their parents would benignly kind of look after them and the mother would be of course cooking you know because in those days women cooked um uh, while she was looking after the children and da, da, da. and it would all be um sort of happy families and you could do all that in an open plan you didn't actually need any walls for privacy or anything like that and it was lovely it was sort of stupid because it was doing that reinventing the human being thing you know but it was sort of Lovely at the same time. So I found this really interesting um, and did some study on these guys. This was um, actually a different house. This is called the Bruce Rotherham House, which is quite famous, a bit of an icon in its own right in New Zealand. Bruce Rotherham was one of the group architects. He was kind of the main guy in, as a sort of design genius. And this was his house. And it's got, it's, it's just this big, um, very low pitch roof shed with this kind of saucer, timber saucer that hangs in the middle. And then underneath that is this uh, brick element, which does the Franklin Wright thing of kind of penetrating the thingo. Um, but it's quite charming because it has, because it does create interior. It carefully makes space. It is trying to make something old and deep as well as something open and new. And it does this sort of fireplace, and then it has the staircase winding up around the fireplace. And then under it is this little wine cellar thing. So it's it's kind of. I thought it was quite enchanting, and students, we used to go and, you know, climb all over it and stuff. This is the plan, really sweet little plan. And of course, textually, it's trying to do something interesting and warmer and um, older than modernism generally. 
approved in those days. So this was uh, 1952. Of course, all of that was all so um, intensely sexist, a bit like the Sydney Push, actually, um, but, you know, proto-interesting. Um, and then, of course, this, which became one of those pilgrimage icons that we all went to see, and we did all go and see it. And again, there was this sort of socialist utopia. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not going to even start pointing out the kind of ridiculousness of thinking that this is a socialist icon, but that, is, that was how it was sort of seen, that the openness somehow implied openness, you know, which, um, in fact, it implies exactly the opposite because you can only live in a house like this if you have, you know, 12-foot stone walls and guards. Um, otherwise, it's not happening. You know, so that's, uh, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, but it did look at that. In those days, this looked like a coming together of sort of the socialist ideal and this sort of transcendent loveliness, which I thought was quite charming. You know, and... and Probably students still do those pilgrimages that you go and see Mies and you go and see Alto and all the sort of Franklin Wright and stuff. I found myself increasingly fascinated by what I thought of as modernism's fatal flaw, like, like it was some Shakespearean character, um, you know, where the, there's that intense contradiction between what it promised, um, and it didn't just not deliver, it actually undermined the very values that it promised to deliver, because most of the time it ended up looking like this you know, which is Hans Stanton. Um, and, and I think being, rightly, being uh, reviled accordingly because it had no, oh, well, we know all that, no relationship to place, no relationship to um, making people feel good. It took a very, very reductivist idea of program and of um, human needs and said, okay, we're satisfying that. <laughs> Be satisfied. This was never a school. I mean, that is not... You know, that's not a place to put children. So, anyway, um, that it's not just grim. It's actually uh, exclusionary and hostile and um, autistic, actually. You know, in the sense that it kind of locks you out. It's about, yeah, go away. So, my undergraduate thesis was uh, looked at masking, the idea of the house as a mask, which, um, again, played with these ideas of covering and revealing of truth and concealment of depth and connection, and connection through a medium, in other words, through a created medium, and whether you could create a medium like a mask or a house to facilitate communication with the world in some um, magical, actually, way. Because masks are magical, have always been magical. They have a transformative power which allows, which doesn't just transform the wearer, but allows... Uh, an enhanced communication with the world, which is a really interesting dynamic, and it, I thought it was interesting and a good analogy with the way architecture could potentially operate, but of course it usually doesn't. Um, then I went to London, oh yes. <laughs> I went to London and got across about a show at the Architecture Association, wrote, wrote a critique because someone said, don't tell me about it, write it down and send it to someone, so I did and it landed on the inside front page and suddenly I found that I was a writer. Um, I, at that point, I was working as an architect in London on the Docklands um, <laughs> and getting frustrated because I was saying, oh, you know, Richard Rogers' office is doing the master plan for the Docklands. We should be talking to them. And, and my boss was going, no, nah, we don't need to talk to them. It's just a master plan. I mean, so, so, I mean, I found architectural practice really, really intensely frustrating. Uh, so I ended up taking this job at the Architectural Review. And this is the basement of it, which was... Interesting to me because it had been created, rescued from an old pub created by people like Nicholas Pesner and Bannum when they were sort of arch modernists, spreading modernism through um, and the states as far as they could. And um, in the meantime, they were making this ancient. Um, this is a <laughs> yeah, this guy was in in the wall. Um, uh, this ancient pub in the basement, and everyone was expected to go and drink at lunchtime and smoke, of course. Um, and this is the pub where we all used to go at lunch. Although Frank Lloyd Wright wasn't generally there, but uh, <laughs> this is, um, that's Frank Lloyd Wright, anyone who doesn't recognise him. This is uh, Robert Maxwell, uh, oh, sorry, Maxwell Fry, and that's um, Ovarup, of course, uh, in 1956. So there was this kind of sense of all of these ghosts of all these famous people, and Betjeman and Bannum and all those people had 
had had my job actually before me and done it better, to be honest. But um, I thought, you know, all that French theory stuff was happening. I was thinking, okay, so if we're going to do this meaning writing about architecture thing, I'm going to understand this. So I spent about two weeks, which is excruciating, reading, you know, Derrida and Baudrillard and the rest of it, and um, thinking, I'm going to get to the bottom of whether this is important for architecture. Um, and I decided in the end it wasn't, sadly, because, all, you know, because of what it, the essential upshot was there, no meaning was possible, all meaning was subjective. You couldn't talk about it. You know, it was just essentially atomizing meaning, uh, it seemed to me. So, but at the same time, of course, I was discovering London and all of these deep, dark I mean, pockets of, of interest and ancientness in this otherwise, I thought, quite ugly town. Um, which fascinated me that you could actually climb into this place, this sense of interiority and of um, <laughs> penetration, of getting into a place was very strong for me in London. And, and uh, it was quite a gradual process. And I remember my boss, Peter Davy, who was a sort of Dickensian character with his great booming voice and, and big hair <laughs> and big uh, sideburns. And um, he used to go to uh, Norway and Finland quite a lot. And he'd come back... Um, with his big furry hat on as well. And uh, he used to smoke all the time and drink all the time, of course. But, but um, cause he, in other words, he was a true Londoner. And he would come back to London and he would go, oh my God, it's good to be back. And he would just climb into it. You could see him snuggling into the city, into the city, not just not home or you know, the office, but actually into the city of London as if that's where he lived, like it was an old glove. You know? It was that sense of coming back. And I was thinking, that's, that's really interesting. That stayed with me, that sense of, City as interior uh, is really strong, and is something that I want to come back to. Um, this, of course, is um, Ings of Court. But they made the mistake of giving me an issue of my own to edit, uh, and <laughs> in spite of my growing interest in this sort of ancientness and stuff of London, I wanted to do something you know, new and uh, out there. So it was called The New Spirit, which was based on Corbusier, but uh, wasn't Corbusian. It was actually about the end of postmodernism, um, and it's. <laughs> I read an essay that was meant to be like one of those ones of Banham's, which started off, "Postmodernism is dead." Um, uh, you know, a whole lot of purple prose. But anyway, um, it was all sort of fresh winds from the future, and it was. And and I had a lot of fun scouring Europe and um, California and UK for architecture that I thought had some kind of meaning. In in other words, that had. That, where there was meaning inherent in the form, that it was doing something meaningful. Um, that's, it's quite difficult to define. So anyway, we ended up with a whole lot of people like um, David Chipperfield, before he was famous, um, Frank Israel, Richard Laplastre was in it, and also my friends Co-op Himmelblau, who are also now famous, and now they go around wearing fur coats and smoking cigars, but in those days they were Marxist hippies um, with long hair and <laughs> this convertible uh, 2CV, which they took me around Vienna in. Um, you had to have a convertible because all this stuff that they were doing was on rooftops. Because um, now they're doing stuff like, oops, that's it. Sorry, that's the new spirit. That was my essay. Um, yeah, we had Fuller, Buckminster Fuller in there as well. Uh, this is what Co-op Himmelblau are doing now as big rock star architects, and they do this a bit like Zaha all over the world. But in those days, they were doing stuff like this, little kind of breakout things, um, which were meant to be explosions of countercultural, you know, revolution in this very, very staid town of Vienna, very kind of uh, lederhosen-wearing um, place it was then. <laughs> and they'd say, and I'd say, so how do you design this? And they go, oh, we just drop some acid, and then we close our eyes, and then we draw something, uh, and then we build it. Um, and you can see how that happens. I think that was pretty much true. <laughs> they were very sweet. Uh, so I decided that perhaps it wasn't all that meaningful after all. Um, but, you know, maybe it was. <laughs> I just couldn't see it. Um, anyway, <coughs> so that was a quite a long time ago, and then I came here, really. Um, but I'm still interested in that core question of the relationship, if any, between ethics and aesthetics. How does beauty make us happy? How does happiness make us good, if indeed those two things are true? That's the question that sits at the heart of Alain de Botton's book, for anyone who remembers it. Um, all the architects I know who read it despised it, um, maybe because he wasn't an architect, or maybe 
he, you know, he, but he did, I liked it because he, well, he can write, and he asked that question, what is, the, what kind of happiness can come to us from place? And how does it change our behavior? And I still think that's a really interesting and important question, and I'm really surprised that we don't talk about it more, and that when we do talk about ethics and aesthetics, we separate them as though they're opposites, as though you do one or the other, you know, and so you get extremes where you get sort of architecture sans frontier, you know, um, which is always kind of worthy and slightly undergraduate feeling. Um, I've insulted those people before, so if they're insulted again, it's just the same stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, it's good works, and it is worthy, but it does always feel a little bit, hmm, um, in the aesthetic department, in my experience. And, uh, you know, and the other extreme is this kind of very she-she, I do interiors um, stuff, and that's the kind of, that's the divide. You know, we don't, we don't try and bring them together. And I'm fascinated by the way we don't. Maybe it's, maybe it's too hard, but it does rely on this idea of meaning, which I still want to explore. So it seems to me that if you talk about architecture having meaning, there are a number of fairly obvious ways in which you might argue that's the case. Um, for example, in terms of its program, you might say, you know, building a school is a good thing, and a hospital is a good thing because of its program, uh, especially a hospital for orphans, say. So, so the better, the, you know, the more worthy the program, the better the architecture in that sense, in that sort of moral sense. Um, and I suppose by, the, by extension, then you have, then prisons and are a bit dodgy, and um, something like this, which is the Christmas Island Detention Center, um, is dodgier still. And <laughs> this actually was a result of a competition, so I, I, this enchants me, you know, because Philip Ruddock had a design competition to design a detention center on Christmas Island. I mean, you're like, what are the criteria going to be? And who is the jury? And what does the brief say, actually? Um, and you know, how good would you feel if you won? Or would you feel, <laughs> uh, not really, you know. So it's a bit, right, iffy, you know. <laughs> um, you know, and, and sort of the extreme of this, uh, of course, is Albert Speer, uh, who's being revived, I see, as we speak, and everyone's saying, oh, he's a good architect. Um, but, it's, but, it, but it comes home, you know. Most architects here work for developers most of the time. Uh, and most developers are not good people, uh, most of us think. So, you know, how does that work? How, you know, um, this for example, you know, that's, I think that's really interesting. So, do you, is it possible to design a good building for a not good person, just in theory? <laughs> um, or, or for a not good function, for a function that you despise, is that actually possible? What would you do if Packer came to you you and said, design me a casino. You know, do you go, no? <laughs> um, or you say, yeah, sure, as long as I can have a lifetime access. Um, you know, so it's, I think those are interesting, but, um, and there's also, of course, the question of environmental stuff. You can define good architecture, morally good architecture, as that which has a sustainable um, role in the world. This is lava, um, lava's prize-winning but unbuilt city centre for Mazda in Abu Dhabi. Uh, you know, the solar collectors, which is really beautiful actually, and at night they close up like flowers and they let the starlight in. And, uh, it's lovely. Um, so it is actually beautiful as well as green. But So those, those are the ways that you could argue um, architecture can have moral qualities, but I'm kind of interested more in the actual form thing and whether form itself can be said to um, have moral import. We know that uh, Ruskin thought so. I mean, Ruskin was mad, of course, <laughs> but he was a good writer. Um, there's wonderful stuff. I mean, I love Ruskin because the <laughs> anyone who can write about classicism being, and I quote, base, unnatural, unfruitful, unenjoyable, and impious, lifeless, unprofitable, and unchristian. <laughs> You know, just as a collection of words. Um, but it was quite difficult to sustain that the Gothic was virtuous and the classical was evil in some way. Um, 
classicism itself, you know, suggests uh, has one life as Pericles and Athens re representing democracy and everything that's enlightened about the world and the future, and another life as you know Albert Speer. So it's very in interesting and difficult this uh, form uh, form relationship with mo the moral, the good. Um, and yet, of course, modernism had no difficulty claiming the good. Uh, Gropius, for example, um, he, it wasn't just, I mean, it, it wasn't just a sort of socialist impulse. It was really, it wasn't just truth to materials. It wasn't just, you know, authenticity. It was much more sort of transcendent than that. He said, you know, in that first manifesto, he says, what is architecture? The crystalline expression of man's noblest thoughts. So and it's, it's quite, it's overreaching, possibly, but um, it was quite a big ask and, and quite glorious as, uh, as an ideal, quite not so glorious as a reality. This is Gropius' own house, um, the director's house at the at Dessau. But um, I, I just think that's really interesting. And, and it's also interesting that this glorious yearning is exactly what dropped us back into what Ken Wilber calls um, the positivist flatland, you know, grey light. I think that flatland is something we're still in. That's why it still interests me. This is not just history. We're still, I mean, we don't think like that necessarily anymore, but we're still doing it, you know. We're still raping the earth, worshipping the object, we as a culture. Um, yielding our cities and our houses to big money or small money, you know, relinquishing all of that placemaking territory to people whose only values are money. Uh, or, no, no, speed as well. So technocrats are money people, engineers are money people, run cities still, broadly speaking. Um, you know, and I've had... <laughs> I have conversations with Lynn Lease where they say, okay, so we've designed the buildings now um, and you'll, you'll be really proud of us because now we're going to get the urban designer in. And I think, <laughs> you know, that's actually, that's actually what they say and actually how they think about it. It's bizarre. Um, and, you know, and they're still building just about everything in Sydney right now. So that's interesting. This, that worldview, I've discovered a name for it, which is great, um, which is instrumentalism. Um, I discovered this quite recently, reading my favourite writer at the moment, who's Roger Scruton, who you might know. Um, and it's a view which is basically pretty simple, which is that everything in the world is important to us and valuable only in terms of its use as a tool to us. Um, you can say it went, started with the Enlightenment, I, I guess, or with modernism maybe, or with the Enlightenment as the sort of, you know, the age of reason. Um, you can take it back to Descartes. This is, <laughs> this is Descartes' idea of how, uh, you know, just Descartes invented the idea that mind and body were completely separate, so he's very big on dualism. So he needed this the pineal gland in the centre here, which is this kind of black box where the magic happened, um, where the immaterial stuff coming in turned into sort of material stuff that um, gave instructions to your body. So, so um, this has been translated more, more recently, of course, into diagrams like this, which is essentially the same idea. And it, what's interesting about this, this is the homunculus idea, and what's interesting about it is that it's, it looks stupid when you draw it like this, but it's actually pretty much how we think of decision-making, not just in terms of our individual selves, but in terms of you know, groups of people, city councils, corporations, you know, countries. You know, this is... Um, if that's Australia, you know, that's Abbott up the top there doing the kind of zzz, and there's stuff coming in and there's little pulleys and it's moving around there and he's going, and then the instructions go down there and the voice comes out. So, and there's this, so it's this mechanical idea of self that um, instrumentalism starts with um, the idea of the planet as an object and I suppose at that level you can take it back to the Bible, um, which of course gave the instruction, I've got it written down here, I love reading things from the Bible. Um, it says in Genesis, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. I mean, as an instruction to give to a band of marauding primates, 
<laughs> yeah. Dangerous, you'd have to say, dangerous. Um, so, you know, you can see this instrumentalism is starting as far back as, as you like, and I think it does start with that idea of objectifying the planet. The planet is here for us, and that's why it's valuable. Um, and our uses for it, are, this is how we still think in Australia, are digging stuff up, selling it, you know, make it, not even making stuff, um, growing stuff, eating it, uh, or digging stuff up and selling it. That's, that's the essence of it. But what's interesting is that you, once you objectify the planet, then you objectify cities and buildings and other people, uh, and eventually you end up objectifying the self. And then you end with the kind of universal narcissism that I think we now have, or at least seem to be in danger of. A lot of people have written, of course, about the culture of narcissism, but I think that's sort of how it works, because once you, if you're saying the planet is here for our use, then you have to define our use, what it means for us, um, and then you have to put your uses, make, you have to make them fairly limited, because they have to be really biological. So when modernism came along with the idea that humans were just biological machines, uh, it fitted very nicely, because then you could defi define needs very in that very limited way, and suddenly the self became the object, and now we have, you know, all the stuff where people care more about their flat abs than about, you know, personal connections. <coughs> and I think, I think that's interesting. I just think it's interesting. In spatial terms, what happens when you translate all of that instrumentalist thinking into spatial terms is also interesting. Um, I think there are three... I mean, there are lots of different things that get lost from instrumentalism, but there are three particularly spatial types of loss, which I think we've suffered. Um, one is interiority, um, and I've got it here, brackets, the feminine. One is the loss of depth, um, brackets, the vertical. And one is the loss of beauty, and the idea of beauty and the belief in beauty, um, brackets, the connective, or maybe the sacred. So I want to just talk a little bit about each of those. This is an image of Troy um, being sacked, or you know, we talk about cities being raped because of that sense, because, which, I, which actually is why this picture interests me, the sense that the exterior space of the city is interior in the way that I discovered in London, that though it wasn't just you know, a whole lot of houses and a whole lot of buildings and then a whole lot of space in between all that stuff, it was actually a collection of spaces. Um, and sort of the extreme of this is a city like this, which is called Derinkuyu, which is in Cappadocia, um, and what's now Turkey. Uh, it was, this is from about the eight, 7th or 8th century BC. There are something like 200 cities under the ground like this. They're not all as extensive as this one. Um, but I think 40 of them have more than, I forget, more than four levels or something. This one is, is extraordinary and fascinating, but, and it held something like 20,000 people, um, complete with <coughs> livestock, horses, stables, you know, schools, hospitals, um, storage rooms. It went down 60 metres below the ground. It also, it has, as you can see, it has vertical ventilation shafts and all sorts of um, all sorts of fascinating spatial intricacies. Inside it looks now like this. Um, and you can see that spatially, it's pretty much the direct opposite of what we do now. Um, in other words, it's kind of, if that's the inny, this is the outy, right? So it's convex, conca concave convex. Um, so modernism flipped the model. I mean, those admittedly are extreme examples, but that makes it easier to make the point. I think, um, you know, this is Barcelona. This is the Gothic Quarter, um, one of my favorite streets, not just because it's really, really narrow and gloomy, but also because of the way that the street wall is um, furnished and embroidered and loved and people sort of chat across it. And it's, it's essentially, even though you'd never get away with building a street like that now, it's a room. It is a room. Um, and this is also Barcelona, um, and again, that sort of spatial inversion that you get. This is Jean Nouvel, of course. Um, in Sydney, you know, we, we, you're all familiar with this. This is Rowe Street, and this is what replaced it, but it's the same deal, the small, the intimate, but also the 
strongly interiorized, the strongly feminine, the strongly um, sort of slow and friable um, space gets replaced with this, which is the opposite in all of those qualities. So um, again, that's, uh, that's a fairly, fairly familiar urban design idea, and I've just summarized it in that little diagram about what happens in cities generally and in this city. Um, and it's kind of Jane Jacobs, um, but again, it's interesting to me because we still do this stuff. We all know that this is sort of the deal, um, and we've all, you know, looked at this, um, the Nolly map, for, you know, ever. Um, but if you, sometimes I think if you, if you could talk to a gathering of, you know, all of the city planners in Sydney, you get them all together in a room and you could talk to them all and say, just try and experiment for a month. When you go to work, don't think about buildings. Think about designing the spaces. Design those as the figure, not the ground, or the ground or whatever it is. Yeah, the figure. Um, design those. Design the spatial experience. Choreograph that and then just let the buildings fit in around it. What would happen, you know? I mean, obviously they'd be sacked, but <laughs> um, in terms of the kind of city that we could make, I think it would be really interesting to try. Um, so, yeah, this is one of my favorite streets in London. It's called Flask Walk, it's in Hampstead, and it's just, again, that idea of the street as a room, which is a familiar idea, and Yet, when I said, for example, to the guys who are putting Darling Harbour together, we should have maybe some intricate little kind of people-y spaces that you could explore and go into and da da da, duck through, connect, you know. They go, nah, we don't want, that's way too intellectual. We want to appeal to the mums and dads. You know, what they were saying is, we just want, you know, a big path, McDonald's, it's fine. Uh, and that's what they do. So it's very interesting. I think that's extremely patronizing. But um, anyway, it's, it's how the people in charge here think. And that's interesting. I think that's really interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, this is, so that's that. And that's that. And that's, yeah. <laughs> what happens when you um, think of public space as being the stuff that you wrap around buildings when you get the urban designer in after you've let the contracts for the buildings? Okay, so um, that's the thing of interior, that loss, uh, quite deliberate loss of interiority and inness uh, in modernism. Next is the loss of the vertical. The, you know, I used to go along to my children's dance lessons and, the, and this woman would say, okay, dance is back, girls, dance is back. And what she meant, she said, you have to imagine a piece of string holding you up. I'm sure you've all done that. And, you, and that's a sort of yoga thing, that sort of piece of string thing. But it's interesting... Um, the intuition that I think people have always had that goodness is vertical, you know, that it comes, it's mostly it comes from above, but the vertical, the sense of verticality um, and the, the relationship between the vertical and the good is very strong. Oh, oh, that's not meant to be there. Um, this is um, Rangi and Papa. Uh, they, they should be lying down uh, yeah. because they are the Maori. Um, this is the Maori uh, creation myth. Uh, Rangi is the sun god, the guy, and Papa is the woman, and she lies down, she's the earth, and he's the sun, and she lies down, and he's lying on top of her, and the children are born uh, in darkness, and they struggle to get out of the darkness, and in struggling, they push the sky apart from the earth and make uh, human life possible. So. Um, what's interesting to me about that is the sense, not just of, of the vertical in the sense of heaven, but the vertical in the sense of, you know, tension between the earth and the sky, between, you know, what's old and what's new or what's, you know, all that sort of stuff. That sense of the tension of the vertical is, is very interesting. Um, but you always, gods are always on top. You know, that sense of upness being uh, not just power, but goodness is very strong in human culture. This is the um, tabernacle the, with the um, Ark of the Covenant and the pillar of cloud above it, you know, marking, it's God's marker of where the covenant is. This is Moses receiving the law. This is, you know, chakras go from, the, you know, the base chakra up to the crown chakra, the sort of the not so good to the good, you know, to the really good. Uh, um, so there's a kind of hierarchy of virtue as you go up the body, um, you know, and this is, 
God and Adam on the on the ceiling. So that sense of upness and goodness is is very strong in history. But um, uh, transcendence is not just vertical; it's sort of invitational. You know, there's a sense of a of an invitation and a dynamic. And yet modernism, oh yeah, <laughs> oh, another favourite painting. Um, this is really, I think this is very touching, this painting. I'm scared I stand up. This kind of, this is what humans do in the face of terror. <laughs> they stand on the face of the planet. Um, and I think that's very touching. Um, and this is, in a sense, you could say this is what modernity did with the vertical. It stood up and it shook its fist at the gods. Um, but what it didn't do is, uh, you know, this is a lot more of those doing that. What it didn't do is make vertical space. It made vertical objects, but not vertical spaces. Uh, and in, as far as I know, in all of these vertical objects, um, there's only one strongly vertical space, and it's this one, um, which you will all know, which does have a sort of celestial quality, uh, which is, of course, one bligh. Um, I know some people here know this very well. But it's interesting, I think, uh, the, I have a quote here from Ken Wilber, who's a kind of, you know, spiritual psychologist type. Uh, he says, instead of an infinite above, the West pitched its attention to an infinite ahead. He's talking about modernism. Uh, the vertical dimension of depth or height was ditched in favor of a horizontal expansion and emphasis not on depth but on span. An other world of any sort was thrown over and the eyes of men and women settled steely on horizons not above but in front, coldly on this world and this world and this world again. If salvation could not be found on this small earth, it could not be found at all. Uh, and yet vertical space has been traditionally what brings a sense of transcendence because space as opposed to object is about connectivity, about the other, about the subject, about connecting subject to subject as opposed to object to object. So it, it's, it's space that undermines or is capable of undermining that instrumentalism. And I use this image because I, it's another thing I did a pilgrimage to as a student and I remember being so disappointed. You know, I thought, ah, oh, the great Frank Lloyd Wright, he did, because it's like, the ceiling's like here. You know, I think, you know, I mean, it's one thing to be short. It's another thing to just design so that everybody has to, you know, it's really, I think it's really, anyway, it's mean, it's mean. Um, so, you know, the library, which traditionally gave dreaming space in the vertical, it provides head space for it, it recognizes the human as, as not just a vertical creature, but a vertical creature with a whole lot of stuff in its head um, and a whole lot of rootedness underneath. So all of those vertical connections were kind of catered to in the traditional library. This is um, Trinity College in Dublin, but it's, you know, there's a thousand libraries like this in the world. Whereas modernism said, no, 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 I don't need that stuff. All you need is shelves of books and space to walk along. So it's fine. Well, what's the issue? You know, um, a church which used to look like this started to look like this. Also, Frank Lloyd Wright, he's coming in for some flack, isn't he? Um, I actually like this building, but it's not a church. It's a really handsome space, but it's not a church. Uh, and now it looks like that. You know, so the trans translation, transliteration of the vertical to the horizontal is almost universal. It's everywhere. Um, and I think that's really interesting, and I feel it as a loss in the environment. I think height and depth are essential to our lives because we are like trees. We do grow to the sky and we do root in the ground and that is important. I mean, it might be metaphorical, but it's important. Beauty is uh, connectivity. Beauty, Iris Murdoch talks about beauty quite a lot. She, was, she says, um, art and morals are with certain provisos one. The essence of both is love. Love is the extremely difficult realization that something other than oneself is real. Love, and so art and morals, is the discovery of reality. And she's talking about that same thing. It's that same subject-to-subject -subject connection, which is actually implies a receptiveness and an openness that the object obsession uh, of current thinking doesn't allow. So, uh, which I think is why beauty, at its best, enables us to feel exalted, 
exalted and uplifted and, and kind of plugged in. It's, it's, it's a connective thing, um, which is also why it's related to happiness. So modernism left us with all kinds of bad spatial habits, I think. Um, this is St. Thomas's Hospital. It's just a little illustration of um, <laughs> one of the ways in which you might... Well, there's a really obvious way in which um, architectural space and human well-being are connected. And this hospital, which is St. Thomas's, the old St. Thomas's in London, on the embankment in London, um, recognised. And it was d designed by a guy called Thomas Cartwright, but it was really designed by Florence Nightingale, who, if you read her letters after the Crimean War, with avian little diagrams, she actually sets out how the wards should be arranged. And she says they should be finger wards with windows for each bed, fresh air, big windows, um, openable windows, so you get fresh air, you get sunlight, you get view. Uh, the argument was pretty simple. She'd noticed in nursing people in the Crimean War that they healed better and more quickly in situations like that. So she said that's how it should be designed, and that's how this was designed. It looks like that, this beautiful little plan uh, with all these finger wards, and then gardens in between, so people had sunlight, as far as there is sunlight in London, um, sunlight coming in, they had fresh air, and so far as there is fresh air, um, and they had gardens. So, it, it, you know, the wards themselves look a little bit grim by our standards, but they still had these massive windows, masses of light. Um, that you notice there's no electric light there, that's all just natural light. But what's interesting about this hospital is that although contemporary research is re-recognising this as a truth, um, this hospital is now more or less derelict. It's just stuffed full of old machines and, and um, those courtyards are full of funny little sheds and it's, it's not used for patients at all. Um, and this is where the patients actually are, is in here. Um, you know, buried in the building because hospitals are all designed about corridor lengths and how long it takes you to get from the ward to the operating theatre and the da-da-da. So it's all about efficiencies. It's not about well-being. Even though we know that, well, that hospitals should be about well-being and well-being is enhanced by architecture. So that's interesting. I think that's really interesting. It's not as if that's changing. Hospitals are still, you know, all the new ones are still bigger than that. Um, and of course, there were like, um, I think there were eight of those finger boards. Most of them were demolished to make way for the behemoth. And not only that, but Florence Nightingale herself, um, revered as she is, is stuck in this little dungeon basement museum where you can go down, you know, through four aluminium doors and then they've uh, passed a security guard to get to see her, uh, the display of um, Florence. We have to pay 10 quid too, so I didn't do it. Um, but anyway, um, it's just, it's an interesting irony, I think a bit of a condemnation of our culture. So I think we need to reintegrate uh, ourselves and our cities. This is just an Escher image which suggests that the capacity to see space and uh, mass and void as parts of a whole, male and female, you know, inness and outness, interiority, exteriority, that's, it's not difficult, it's just we all need to cultivate the capacity to flip from one view to the other. I'm not saying we need to design cities, you know, with all female spaces or all deep interiority or anything. We need both. Um, and we need both because it's the tension between those that makes life <coughs> exciting and creative. I think Australia in particular is still devoted to that old last century instrumentalist uh, thinking. And I think that's partly because we are still in denial about being here being, you know, the wrong white crowd in this country. <laughs> you know, we still ask uh, that thing about um, should we recognise Indigenous people in the Constitution? I mean, hello. <laughs> I can't believe, I can't believe it. There's this uh, um, last little quote from a fellow called David Tacey, who's a theologian, in fact, writing in Melbourne. He says, um, an Aboriginal elder of the, I'm not going to pronounce this very well, Nyarinyan people, David Mawaljalai, told me in 1996 that, and he quotes, spiritual, spiritual, spirituality is coming back in Australia. This is a spirit country, he said, and we, still, we all have to face the sacredness of the land. Um, we all have to face the sacredness of the, we will all have to face the sacredness of the land. That's really interesting. And he's not talking about we Aboriginal people, he's talking about we, everyone. 
have to relearn to re-listen to the sacredness of the land. He says, we will learn this through our feet. He, he, say, he talks about that thing of, um, you know, goodness and celestial instruction coming from above in most cultures. He says in Australia, it comes through the ground. We will learn this through our feet from below. Uh, I don't know enough to know whether that's true. Um, for me, again, the New Zealand painters say it best. This is uh, Colin McCann again, um, another favourite madman. He, uh, he starts off with this am I question and ends up with I am. Uh, and this is Ralph Hautre, uh Le Papa et More, but he, which I see as a play with, a play on, um, I mean, he's talking about the Pope, of course, but, but uh, I see it as a play on Papa, the Earth Mother. Whether or not that's intended, I can't tell you. Um, this is another, the vertical is very strong at, in these paintings. Is that the, the, there's a lot of darkness in New Zealand, as you know, as anyone who's watched the piano knows. Um, but there's also a lot of this sense of the vertical. It's very intensely romantic. That's what I mean by this romantic tradition. Um, I know this stuff is embarrassing, and I know, as I said at the start, that it's impossible, almost impossible, to front, you know, a bunch of lend honchos with their big square shoulders and say, ah, oh, yeah, but, you know, what about the feminine? And they're going to... <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I also think if, if we don't... I think we know this stuff in our lives and we don't take it to work because it's too hard. Because at work, it's all run by the finance guys and the engineers and the all that, and it's all, and that's all that kind of... And we all feel that pressure. I know every time I write something that's embarrassing like this, and I think, oh, I'm just going to get all that stuff again from all those guys, and they're going to say all that stuff. But I sort of think if you don't say it, it doesn't change. And I think that's why I love um, Malala, you know, who just won the Peace Prize. I think, you think of her standing up to the Taliban and going, I'm reading this book. I don't care. You shoot me, I'm going to read this book. Um, you know, and that's that kind of stuff. So I think it's important, and I think we need to learn it. I think this is personal favourite building. Um, I love the coming together of the horizontal and the vertical. I love the way it's made of space and light and not a thing. I also love this, the space that you're in. I, the, it's very unusual for a modern architect to be able to capture um, that sense of sacredness, I think. Another one that does it for me is this. This is uh, Zumthor, of course, Buddha Klaus Chapel, which is the most beautiful thing, and which is one of those buildings that almost has no exterior. It's like it does have an exterior, it sits in a field, but the exterior is sort of nothing, and the, all the magic is in the space. It's all about the space and the light and making it. And also, of course, the story, because this is about lost log technique. You know, he made the sort of log teepee and then burnt it out with the concrete around it. And, and uh, so there's something in the narrative that's beautiful as well, but it's also, but the, just the space is really moving. So my argument is simply that, that if we can start to re-listen to the landscape, start to think as subjects, uh, and re-hear the magic of the landscape, then maybe we can start to make a proper future in this place. Thank you.